for those who are not experts like these guys. Um, vases are painted by artists whose name we usually do not know. Very rarely does it say, this is painted by so-and-so. So, uh, scholars have a convention of naming vessels in a way uh, like the Sawatsky Stemnos. Um, or upstairs we have the maple wood vase because we don't know what else to call it and we come up with something uh, that could be a collector's name or a location where the uh, object is. In this case, we're talking about a vessel attributed to an artist only known by the designation Darius Painter. I will explain where that name comes from in a bit. Our vase is upstairs in the Lemonopolis Gallery, Life and Death in the Ancient World. Talking about this, the fact that uh, the uh, literal pair uh, of this vase is in the St. Pete MFA, illustrates something of Bill's generosity, uh, but also his very keen eye for ancient masterpieces. We see here this very bucolic scene on a red figure, Calyx Crater, that's a mixing vessel uh, that just like its counterpart on the other side of the bay is 17 inches high. So it's attributed to either the Darius painter or uh, that artist's workshop. We've been just talking about the more you look at it, the less you know. Um, seated uh, in the middle might either be Dionysus or Pan, uh, with a draped mantle holding a libation dish or bowl called the fiale, uh, with a flinging stick, a lagobolon, uh, in his, is it in his hand? or lean, yeah, uh, and also a pan flute at his feet, the syrinx. In front of him stands a woman. Is it a, a maenad? Is it a goddess? She holds a mirror and at her foot is a deer or fawn. Then there is a satyr with the horse's tail. Satyrs are horse creatures, or at least partly, uh, but with human feet, carrying a ritual vessel called a situla uh, and also holding a stalk, a thyrsus, that is associated with the god Dionysus. And then all the way in the upper right is a creature with goat legs. So that could be a little pan, paniscus, or maybe a fawn, carrying a pan flute, the syrinx again, also a flinging stick, uh, and an animal skin or belt over his arm. This pairs with uh, this piece at the St. Pete MFA, uh, a more clearly Bacchic scene. Red figure calyx crater again, 17 inches high, 16 inches in diameter, again attributed to the Darius painter or his workshop, um, and uh, set to come from the same grave. We see a youthful Dionysus seated on a draped mantle, um, holding again a libation bowl, uh, fiale, carrying the thyrsus, the stalk, um, and at his feet, you see a calyx crater and um, also a, a cantharus, a wine cup. So a little uh, what we call in the Netherlands a droste effect, where the object is depicted on the object itself. And on this object, I think there are three dancing figures. Isn't that right? Um, again, standing woman. Uh, could be a maenad, goddess, maybe even a muse, who holds a theatrical mask of a fleax uh, actor, that's a sort of burlesque uh, performer, uh, with his foot on rocks. Above hovers a winged eros who uh, holds a wreath and a ribbon. We see another satyr with the horse's tail, human feet, holding a large hand drum or tympanon, carrying again a stalk, the thyrsus, uh, and at his feet is a ritual vessel um, so it's not an identical, but very similar scene. So these are uh, attributed to the same workshop at least. Um, why do we call it the Darius painter? Well, that's because of this vase. This is called the Darius vase, the eponymous vase uh, that uh, gave us the name. We'll get there in a bit. This one is four feet and three inches tall. It's uh, a lot more monumental. Um, this is where the anonymous artist is named after, found in Canosa, Apulia in 1851. It is now in the National Archaeological Museum in Naples. Um, this artist um, painting red figure vase paintings in what is called the ornate style, um, was active in Taras, Apulia, uh, Tarentum. Uh, around 330 to 320 BCE. 
Uh, he is considered the greatest of South Italian vase painters. Uh, certainly one of my favorites since I first got um, uh, informed about South Italian vase paintings. Um, just for scholarly interest, he's the successor of the Varese painter, uh, of whom we have an object in our collection as well, and the pre predecessor of the Underworld painter. Um, why is this called the Darius vase? Well, this seated figure, uh, if you can see it, we'll get a little closer up uh, in a bit. Like here, there's an enthroned figure, that's the Persian king, Darius the Great. He reigned in Persia from 522 to 486, so a lot before our vase was made. Um, he is famous for the Battle of Marathon, Thermopylae, Salamis, or Salamis, uh, as some Americans like to say, um, at the time when Greece and Persia were engaged in uh, about 50 years of war. Um, why could this be relevant to paint in the middle of the 4th century, so much later? Well, right at the same time that this painter uh, was active, Alexander the Great was engaged in a campaign against another Persian king who also happened to be called Darius, Darius III, who reigned from 336, uh, only six years, until 330. Alexander the, Re the Great had come uh, onto the throne in the same year, 336. Um, his campaign at that point had already started because his father uh, had um, taken the Macedonian and Greek armies into Asia Minor. Um, Alexander the Great also did not live very long, but longer than Darius, he died in 323. Um, so it may be that this vase is echoing one Darius against another, that we are painting the guy from a century and a half ago, but we're also commemorating the fact that uh, the Macedonians are campaigning against the Persians. Um, but it may also be a reference to a, a dramatic performance by Aeschylus, the Persae. Um, both of these allusions uh, we will return, but let's look a little closer to uh, the depictions on the vase. So it's monumental, both in size uh, and ornamental in its composition. We see on the neck uh, a combat scene. Sometimes people try to interpret, is that the Greeks fighting the Persians in the Persian War, or is this the Macedonians and the Greeks fighting in the contemporary war, or maybe it's just a kind of Persians against Greeks uh, more lifted into a mythical uh, narrative. Then the main body of the vessel is divided into three registers. Uh, at the top you see the Olympian gods. If we go from left to right, we see Artemis seated on a deer with a hound at her feet, Apollo with a swan, Zeus with a winged Nike uh, holding a thunderbolt next to him, then a female figure who is fortunately for us identified with a little inscription. It says Hellas. In other words, she is the personification of Greece. Then Athena with helmet, aegis, and shield. Um, and another personification uh, identified with a little inscription as Apate, the personification of deceit, because that's how wars begin. And then at the far right seated is Asia, the personification of that continent, um, uh, with a kind of female herm behind her. Then the most important register is in the middle. We see here King Darius giving audience, and right in front of him is a person standing on a podium, and just to make clear who it is, it says Persians. Is that, that this person is a sort of summary of all the Persians who are giving audience to the king, or is it a reference to Aeschylus' play that is also called Persai? Um, King Darius is listening intently. He has a bodyguard behind him. Uh, there are one or two princes uh, there as well, and some courtiers. Then at the bottom is uh, the royal treasury. The lower register uh, shows us the collection of taxes and tribute, with some of the vessels uh, kneeling in obeisance in front of the tax collector. So this vase is made around the time that uh, Alexander the Great is campaigning against Persia uh, and ultimately uh, will conquer the Persian Empire. 
as I mentioned, his opponent is Darius III, uh, a king who met Alexander in battle uh, twice, the Battle of Issus and the Battle of Gaugamela. The uh, mosaic that you see behind the vessel here, uh, very difficult to see, it has a lot of terrific details. Um, here you see King Darius, and here you see Alexander the Great. It clearly shows the chaos that happens on the battlefield. Uh, this is very likely a mosaic modeled after a painting uh, that was made in Alexander's time. Uh, we call it the Battle of Isis, uh, Isis uh, but it's not entirely sure if this is meant to be a historical battle or just, again, kind of generic, when Alexander fought King Darius kind of battle. So the Darius phase is contemporary with this campaign, um, and uh, it would seem to draw that analogy right between the King Alexander is fighting, they have uh, the, who has the same name as Darius the Great when the Greeks were fighting the Greco-Persian Wars from 499 to 449. Uh, the contemporary Persian king is opponent of Alexander the Great, but why would that matter in South Italy, in Apulia? Um, why would that be relevant? Uh, is it a reference to Greek drama or to, current, or to the current conflict? Um, we, of course, also have to make the argument that the painter painted this, uh, this face um, not in the beginning of his career, but in the second half of his career. Of course, also the question, what is the purpose of such a monumental uh, crater, uh, too large to be mixing water with wine? Um, why would anyone in Apulia want to have such an enormous crater? Maybe we can return, see what my colleagues think. But um, this wasn't everything. There's an additional, more mythic scene depicted on another crater attributed to the Darius painter here in the Tampa Bay area. It's a red figure calyx crater, this time 22 and 3 quarters of an inch high. Um, we see here King Yobatis of uh, Lycia, that's in southwestern present-day Turkey, again seated on a throne, holding a scepter and wearing what scholars tend to call a Phrygian cap. Uh, Phrygian cap is shorthand for uh, identifying someone as not Greek, coming from the East usually, but uh, black Africans can wear it, people from Scythia, not necessarily identifying the person as coming from Phrygia. Um, so in front of him, or before him, stands Bellerophon, uh, holding a letter, which uh, anyone who knows the story of Bellerophon would know, includes a death warrant on him. He carries a trident from his grandfather Poseidon, and behind him is the winged Pegasus. Bellerophon was a heroic slayer of monsters, such as the Chimera. Uh, behind the king is standing a woman that might well be uh, Stene Boea, um, and behind her is a bodyguard. Um, in the upper register, and again, a divine sphere, there is a, a fawn or paniscus. It's rather hard to see here, I'm afraid, with the, the shadow. Um, who has goat legs? With, we see Apollo again with a swan, a winged eros this time with wreath and ribbon, and a goddess with a dish, who is hard to identify perhaps Athena, because she has some relevance in this mythic tale. Uh, could it be an allusion to an Euripidean play? Uh, we know that uh, Euripides wrote a Bellerophon. Um, so the title of that play certainly references the hero, but the plot does not take place, uh, for as so far as we know, at uh, King Yobata's court. Um, but Euripides also wrote a Stenoboea about the princess the daughter of King Iobates, who had accused Bellerophon uh, of raping her after he had repulsed her advances. So maybe that is what this play is referencing. Of Unfortunately, uh, beyond the title, there is very little known of what Euripides wrote in that play. Maybe not entirely by accident, but what uh, is so interesting in bringing these collections into the same museum is that from the Josephich Noble collection that we acquired uh, in 1986, 
we have two fragments that connect with the stories, with the objects that we've just described. We have Pegasus captured by Bellerophon on another Apulian crater fragment, though not attributed to the Darius painter. And we have here in the middle depicted the judgment of Paris that uh, uh, Bill, you just referenced earlier today uh, in a different context. Uh, that's a fragment from a Volut crater that is attributed to Darius. We see here Paris um, uh, seated wearing again that Phrygian cap and he is accompanied by two of the three goddesses uh, of whom he has to pass judgment, who is the most beautiful. Probably uh, uh, a third uh, has fallen off the, the scene. On the right, we see Hermes, and uh, above, again, the figure of Eros. And again, that is not all, because Bill also purchased this comic scene. Uh, this is called Gnathian technique, where you have black glaze, fired in the kiln and then painted over. The calyx crater shape again, uh, this time 15 and 3 quarter inches approximately, and it's attributed either to the Compagnien or the Darius painter. Uh, this is the man who can help with uh, elucidating that attribution. We see a burlesque actor, uh, that's a fly fleax. He wears a costume of white tunic, tan leggings, sandals, uh, I think he wears a mask, conical cap, and a cane, upside down. Uh, in the background you see bull skulls, uh, Bucrania, and a rosette. What is very interesting is that there is an inscription in between the figure and these uh, bull skulls. Derkilos, that's a personal name. We know of his historical individuals who have that name, but interestingly it also means something like sparkly eyes. So could that be a personal name like the actor's name? Uh, could it be a stage name or a nickname? Um, or could it reference an actual human being or a character in a play? It just so happens that at this very same time that the Darius painter uh, was active, an Athenian envoy to Macedonia also had the name Derkilos. Uh, he was active from around 340, 345. Uh, he is mentioned by two of the ten most important Attic orators of the 5th and 4th centuries, who were his opponents, uh, Aeschines and Demosthenes. Uh, this place uh, during the reign of Philip II, the father of Alexander the Great, at a time when Athens was struggling very hard to remain independent uh, and not become part of the Macedonian expansion. Um, but why would there be a historical figure depicted as a funny guy, as a, a burlesque actor? Well, um, we know that Athenian comic plays were very popular in southern Italy, particularly the middle comedy that is relevant for this particular period, of which very little survives, uh, apart from the later plays of Aristophanes, who already died in 385. There are many other plays of this uh, period of about 80 years, uh, certainly the, um, uh, uh, a reference to the historical Derkilos could have been made in a comedy that is uh, performed in South Italy. I'm not saying that I know, because we've learned today, the more you look into it, the less certain you can get. Uh, but it is a possibility, it is certainly earlier in, uh, in comedy, uh, the earlier plays of Aristotle, they poked fun at historical figures like Socrates uh, or uh, some of the politicians. Um, because this Derkilos is so significant at that particular time when Philip and Alexander are about to campaign against Persia, it's not impossible. All of this shows something of um, what uh, in academic circles we like to call connoisseurship. We've heard today that Bill uh, is also uh, a self-taught scholar. He uh, wrote the book on South Italian vases in the Tampa Bay area, uh, which um, in addition to its first publication had three supplements uh, that seem to get bigger uh, by each publication. Um, and I was struck for Zawatsky craters that it, uh, attributed to the Darius painter in one collection, 
plus the noble fragment, all of that here in the Tampa Bay. Remember this man, the Darius painter, uh, was one of the greatest of his time. There are scholars who call him the Rembrandt of his age. Um, so these are masterworks of fourth century vase painting. They may not have been seen or considered as such in their own time um, compared to all the things that we've lost and uh, can only imagine. We can also see that Bill started acquiring these very early. 1983-84, he bought uh, some of the uh, vases that we've seen, uh, and another in 1993. There were very few scholars interested in the Darius painter until the 90s, uh, and uh, even fewer collectors showed any interest. So for uh, Bill to pick, to pick that up, to have an interest in South Italian, an interest in theater and an interest in this master painter. Uh, I think that that is uh, quite an, in, an in illustration uh, of the passion and the enthusiasm, the dedication and the keen eye that Bill Zawadzki has. Uh, and Bill Zawadzki has many interests. They range from Greek myth and religion to tragedy and comedy. Um, he loves the fact that some of these vases may uh, have allusions to Aeschylus or Euripides, maybe middle comedy, even include an actor's name. Um, they are, again, testament to his connoisseurship. Um, it, they are examples of a dedication of a lay person or a dilettante uh, with uh, a lot of time and persistence uh, to build a collection with his personal touch uh, and I think I can speak for everyone at the TMA and before that we are very proud to have these pieces here on display in Tampa. So thank you for your time, for your attention.